you, Sarah. Thank you, Herbert. Hi, thank you, Lucy. It's lovely to be here. Um, just to introduce myself briefly, I'm Sarah Mercer. I'm one of the third authors on this book. One of our co-authors is missing, but I think, or I'm hoping, that she's in the chat box because I think she's in the audience today. Marion Williams is the person who initiated this project and had the inspiration for the original idea. And we're sorry she couldn't join us in presenting today, but delighted that she's been able to join us, at least in the audience. Yes, hello, and I'm Herbert Puchter, um, teacher trainer, uh, materials writer and teacher. And uh, I'd also like to welcome you most warmly and send a special hello also to our co-author Marion. I've just seen her name in uh, among the list of attendees. Hello, Marion. OK, without further ado, we'll get started and we'll introduce you to the book and some of our thinking behind it. Um, I don't seem to be able to move it, Herbert, so just let me have another go. Let me see if that works. Sorry, Herbert. Should there be okay go. now. Brilliant, uh, thank you. Is it working? Not yet. Okay. There you go. <laughs> um, we're going to give you a little bit of an outline of what we plan to do today. So we're absolutely delighted to introduce you to a new book that we work together on. Um, we're going to talk a little bit first about our personal motivation. So what was behind us wanting to put this book together, what our thinking is behind it, what we hope that you're going to get out of this. Um, we'll tell you a little bit about why we think psychology is so important, important for language learning and perhaps not just language learning, but learning generally, but particularly language learning. Um, we talk a little bit about how language teachers can be seen as a coach and a role model in terms of psychology. Then we're going to show you three activities from the book and work through them with you. And then we're going to try and make sure that we leave time at the end for a quick Q&A and a chance to chat with you and answer any questions that you might have and discuss some, some thoughts about the, the book and the project. Sorry, Herb, but I, I'm struggling to make it move. There we go. Um, Herbert, do you want to talk first about your motivation? So what drew you to this project? Well, first of all, of course, it was this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, to work on, on this project uh, together with, with Marion and, and yourself. Um, Marion and I had already written a book uh, for helping teaching young learners to think. And, and when this opportunity came up to work with her and with you, um, I could not have um, uh, jumped at it immediately. My second motivation has to do with, with my own uh, background, my own experience as a, a language teacher, as a materials writer. Um, that can probably summed up best in, in many ways um, uh, by two quotations from Earl Stiebig. The first one is that language teaching is a total human experience. Mm -hmm. and, and the second one that success in language learning depends less on materials, uh, and I'm saying this as a materials writer, techniques and linguistic analysis and more on what goes on inside and between the people in the classrooms. Of course, materials are important. Language is important. Of course, that's, that's our, our key goal as language teachers, to teach language, isn't it? But um, helping our students um, make the most out of um, their own capabilities, uh, helping them with their insecurities, helping them to get into a, into a flow of learning, and, and many other objectives have always been extremely important for me. And, and this book, uh, in a way, um, has offered an opportunity for myself to, to learn how to do this, how to do all that and a lot more in a systematic way. Yeah, I think this was, I, I think you've said everything that I could possibly say, sir, but it very much resonates with where I came from. So I've done a lot, a lot of my own work has been inspired by psychology, whether it's as a researcher, but also as a teacher. And in some of my early work, I came to understand that you can have the best materials in the world 
you can have the most inspiring set of, of course books and materials. But if the learners are not in the right place, if there, if there isn't that sense of psychological safety in the classroom, if learners are not literally in the right frame of mind for learning, then those wonderful materials may not be realized in practice. And so a big drive for me was helping teachers to have a range of options and systematically understand how they can create that frame of mind for learning, how we can facilitate that frame of mind for learning. I don't think it's as I think teachers do a lot of this anyway. I think many teachers, it is rare that any of you would go to the classroom and not think about how to reduce learner anxiety or how to design teaching sessions in a motivating way. But as Herbert just said, very often we do that unconsciously and not in a very systematic way. It's a little bit ad hoc. And this was a chance to work with two brilliant um, materials designers and people who've got fantastic practical ideas, something I'm not brilliant at. And it was a great chance to learn from you both about what are the systematic ways that we can put this into practice, take what we understand as being so facilitative for learning and make it accessible, give us actual practical teaching ideas that we can use in our day to day teaching. And that's what my drive behind doing this book was. So I guess this would be a question for the audience. Um, there are obviously, as Herbert said earlier, the primary motive for teaching is obviously that we're there to teach language, but we have various reasons why we think psychology is particularly learn important for learning a language. And this is a chance for you to share your ideas in the chat box. Why do you feel psychology is important for language learning? Or if you don't think it's that important, maybe why you don't think it's important. So please just use the chat box and have a chat with us and tell us some of your thoughts and give us a chance to respond to those as you go on. Hi, Elizabeth, nice to see you. Uh, yeah, to get the right environment. What do we mean by the right environment? I love the idea of the, the whole environment. Any other ideas? Marcella, that's great. So the emotions, it's all about cognition. Oh, Heike, we could talk a lot about that, I think. Um, helping to learn, understand learners' motivation, attention. Can't read that quick. Um, oh, hi, Marjorie. And to look at the growth mindset, how they think. Uh, to understand the complexity of motivation and learning. Look at some of the psychological aspects that emerge. Safe from embarrassment. I think that's a good one. I'm glad you put that in. Um, Gustavo, hello. Nice to see you. To address emotions, to make learning free of anxiety, to motivate, to help them know what steps to take, to recognize that there are no failures. It's just part of the growth process. You've got some brilliant ideas. Heike, that's my theory of mind. So being able to empathize and understand the way other people think. So for me, one of the key things is that cognition and emotion are tied together. They're not separate things. So if we want to think about how we think and how we how we facilitate attention and processing and uh, language production, all of that goes through an emotional lens. They're not separate things. Herbert, do you want to comment? I think we'll, we'll need to ask Zoom to, to prepare a kind of slow motion uh, <laughs> version of this, because this has been so fast and I admire you, Sarah, for being able to, to actually comment so, <laughs> so promptly. Now, I think this is wonderful and it, it really sets um, um, the, the, the ground for, for what we're actually going to, to discuss. Hopefully, you will see at least a few of your, your ideas having come to life also in, in our book. I'll switch to the next, Sarah. Um, so we put down a few of the reasons. Now, obviously, this is not all of the reasons that we were thinking about, about why we think psychology is so important. And again, I think you're going to recognize many of the things that you've, you've just commented about. So emotions are fundamental to how we learn. There is, you can never experience anything without an emotional tone in the background. And so it's not about, one of the things we want to stress is it's not about dismissing negative emotions. It's about finding ways to balance those, to manage those along with the positive emotions. So deliberately thinking about the emotional climate we create in the classroom. I think this is what, what the person was, what Elizabeth meant earlier when she talked about this emotional, this environment that we create. We also want to think about how we see ourselves, whether we see ourselves in a positive light, whether we have got um, inhibitions, anxieties, all of that will influence how we approach learning, what actions we take, what we do, how we go about things. 
what we believe about language learning influences our behavior, and that applies also to teachers as well. So as a teacher, what you believe about language learning and teaching processes is also part of how you behave, how you approach your teaching, your actions. Um, fundamentally, and I think this is something that Herbert was touching on earlier, that fundamentally language learning is about communication. And if it's about communication, it's between people, whether that's in writing or orally. So good language learning means good language interpersonal skills, being able to use communication effectively. Language learning is a slow process. It takes time. It's not something I think one of the famous quotes is it's it's not a uh, it's not a it's not a short run. It's a long marathon. It just takes time and perseverance. And that needs a certain frame of mind so that you don't get disheartened along the way. Several people also commented that language learning involves successes and failures, and it's understanding both of those and how we respond to that and how that makes us open to take risk, to approach learning, to have the courage to put ourselves out there when we learn, when we use a language. And I think this is what both Herbert and I talked about at the beginning is that our fundamental motivation for doing this is that learners are holistic beings. They don't come to the classroom and leave their identities, their anxieties, their emotions behind. They come as a whole person. And that was something that underlined El Stevic and the humanist uh, approach to language teaching. And that's something that we wanted to deliberately engage with and embrace is how we can teach with that whole person in mind in a way to facilitate and strengthen their approach to learning. Herbert. All right. So let me just get the next slide. Okay. Um, so, I mean, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. You know, obviously it's dictum that comes from, from Aristotle. So, um, in, in many ways, this has been at the heart of um, um, educators' um, concern for, for a very, very long time. I'd like to address this by, by going back to my own um, early years of teaching, which, you know, was about 100 years ago or so, um, when I was teaching lower secondary students. And after the first few years, I noticed that uh, there were certain classes at the school where I was teaching that nobody wanted to teach. And I actually explicitly asked for um, those classes, being, being allowed to teach those classes. So it was students who were generally regarded as difficult, very often coming from a difficult um, social background, uh, being regarded as um, not very uh, able academically. And of course, um, teaching them, especially for me as a young teacher first, was a huge challenge. But, but the key point I learned there was that if I didn't actually manage to take them seriously, if, it, if I didn't reach out to them and accept them as who they were, then there was no way I could teach them anything. Because many of them um, were pretty defensive about themselves. Their, their, their self-worth obviously was not really uh, well uh, developed. And, and if learners are not safe, they're more uh, vulnerable um, um, to, to fear. They, they, their capacity um, to discover, to explore will be limited. Um, their capacity to remember will be limited and, and learning is anything but fun for them. So uh, that's something that, that I learned actually, that I needed to take them seriously as who they were. And of course, taking them seriously as who they are is about educating uh, the heart and the mind at the same time. And I think probably if I can mention at this point, also for people who are here, I, it doesn't, this applies to every learner. So not just those who are struggling and not just those who are maybe having difficulties, even the most gifted learners that we may work with, they still need to have that connection on a very human level. Elizabeth put a lovely comment in the comment box. She said, we have to go through the heart to teach challenging students. 
you know, honestly, I think we have to go through the heart to teach every student. That's part of what teaching is, is making that human connection. And as Herbert says, allowing the learner to be who they are authentically and to be met on their terms in that learning into counter. Right. So um, this is all about um, skills for learning and, and language um, for learning a language and um, for life at the same time. Um, we think that this book is actually psychology in, in practice is actually the first of its kind. And, and we hope it will be helpful and stimulating to, to colleagues. Um, we believe it offers a, a dual strand approach because on the one hand, of course, our goal is language teaching. So in our activities, we have very, very clearly specified the kind of language, language teaching objectives you will be able to cover uh, by using the activities in the book. Um, we, we hope that learners and we're sure that learners will find them engaging and also relevant to the real world, okay? Um, when, when we talk to teachers, when we, when we travel or when we still used to travel and hopefully we'll travel again one day, uh, we find, I mean, the three of us, Marion and, and Sarah and I, that um, teachers often have a real passion to go beyond um, uh, teaching language, to, to be educators in the first place, because um, one of their, their goal is to help learners to become uh, global um, citizens. So what we're doing here is um, we're hoping to develop students' confidence, develop their sense of agency so, they, so we can encourage them, you can encourage them to take an active role in their learning and in the world um, at large. So what we're doing to, to sum this up is to develop learners' uh, linguistic skills and their non-linguistic skills, their life skills at the same time. So I just add that um, if any teachers who might be having concerns, one of the things that Herbert and Marion have done brilliantly with the activities is always made sure that there's a language learning goal as well as a non-linguistic psychological goal. And that's what they've done beautifully is managed to intertwine that dual focus in a way that all the activities contribute to learning the language and at the same time are contributing to life skills. Um, perhaps another thing just to comment is that from the research, we know that when we improve things such as confidence, lower anxiety, strength and well-being, boost compassion and resilience, those skills help learners to learn and they also help them to cope in life more broadly. So it's not that we're creating something additional, something that's an add-on that is extra. It is fundamental to what we do and it puts them in a better place to learn language through other types of activities as well. So perhaps that's important to understand that these activities are not just in isolation, these create foundations for learning language through other activities that you may do as well, because it empowers the learners to give them that sense of agency. And, and just to add to this um, a little bit, we know as language teachers and as linguists, that um, using a language that one has learned, which is not one's own language, can actually be an extremely uh, joyful experience. We, we, we all, I guess, share a passion for language, and, and we know that many of our learners do. But there are also other learners, and, and, and we've all come across them, for whom learning a foreign language and the pressure of having to use it, especially in front of others, creates anxiety, uh, creates um, fear. So they need to develop skills like, like, just to mention a few, courage, perseverance, uh, confidence, openness. And, and this is something that can serve the individual, but can, can serve them in the classroom when learning a language, but, but also... Um, in any walk of life. And this, this is what we are talking about. We're talking about transferable um, skills, really. Um, so let's uh, move on a little bit and let me ask you, 
to um, type in uh, the answers to this this question in the chat box again. Shall I speed read again? <laughs> <laughs> you will have to, Sarah. <laughs> if I can do it quick. <laughs> in what ways, because we're sure you already teach with psychology in mind, uh, some of us may, may be doing this more consciously, others may be doing this more, more intuitively maybe, but, but I guess most of us, or probably all of us, are doing it in some way. So take a bit of time and don't type too fast, please. <laughs> I'll read as quick as I possibly can. Oh, so someone's talking about future self, which is around uh, images that they have that can motivate. Um, that's a, a really good way to help them. Um, brainstorming and mindfulness, that's a nice idea. So helping them to find ways to keep calm and to focus. Um, icebreaker to relax, put people mindful practices, lovely. Great ways to kind of lower anxiety and keep people focused. Um, getting learners to reflect on their past experiences. That's quite important about thinking about how your past affects the present. Uh, Ava, nice to see you. Mental health is hugely important as that this sense of well-being also facilitates our openness to learn, our ability to learn. And Marjorie says that, of course, you can't imagine not thinking about learner attitudes or how they think or the beliefs that they have. Ah, Dorota, hello. Positive communication. So also making learners aware of their strengths and what they're doing well. Um, Heike talks about emotional contagion. So thinking about group dynamics in the classroom and getting the links across uh, between learners together. Um, Jessica says laughter, which I think laughter and good humor is a wonderful place to create that psychological safety and positive learner atmosphere. Um, brain breaks, Gustavo, hugely important. A chance to just recover and have a little bit of a, a chance to have a bit of exercise, oxygen to the brain, hugely important. Um, empowering through the arts, as a couple of people have mentioned arts now, that's a really nice thing and that we've got some activities about art and awe inspiring images and what awe can do to also strengthen our sense of position in the world. Um, caring and sharing, Isabel says, that's the, the wonderful title of the book originally by um, Maskovitz in the humanist period, so caring and sharing, showing learners that you care allowing learners to show that they care for each other and this sense of cooperation and collaboration. And we have a whole chapter about working on those relationships in the classroom between learners that's so important. Was that, I slowed down here, but now it was going a bit slow. It was a bit easier this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lovely, wonderful. And thanks for, I think it was Jessica, for, for mentioning the power of humor also. Laughter is so important, isn't it? Because it helps to release uh, tension in the classroom and, and that is so important. And that's also so important for us as, as teachers. So uh, in, in many ways, um, what we, of one metaphor we, we use there, there's of course several different metaphors that one can use to look at what the, the teacher does. But one, one metaphor is to see the, the teacher as a, a coach for, for language learning, a coach that um, somehow senses the, the student's real potential and, and um, uh, what they might be able to achieve, not only as learners, but also as as human beings. Uh, Sarah has recently pointed out to me um, interviews given by Emma uh, Raducanu, the, the um, I think, Canadian-born um, British uh, new tennis star. I think she's 18 and she's just won um, the, the um, uh, whatever it's called, the, the American the, Open. American Open, that's right. Uh, she's actually, um, she was born in Canada to a Rom Romanian father and a Chinese mother, and she grew up in, in London. And it's quite interesting uh, what she says. I mean, the, the kind of um, um, reflection she has about um, her own upbringing and also the role that different people have played in her life and how important that has been. Um, uh, for her. For example, she says about her, her mom and that side of the family, she says, they are so mentally resilient. 
it's like nothing can bring them down. I'd say I take a big part of my inspiration from her. My mom um, has worked very hard um, uh, learning about discipline and res and I learned about discipline and respect for other people from her. So she is referring to what we are talking about um, here. And I was actually also looking for what her coach uh, says. Nigel Sears, her coach says, I think the sky is the limit. Uh, she has the necessary qualities and she's hungry enough um, and eager, eager to learn. And you know, she's ambitious and she wants to do it. And I just think that given the right opportunities and more match experience, I think she'll make good progress. It's really up to her how far she goes. I think this is wonderful. Uh, what the coach is actually saying, he is recognizing the the... Uh, the resources and the, the potential capabilities of um, uh, Emma. Uh, and at the same time, of course, he also says it's up to her. So I, as a coach, I can um, uh, support her. I can facilitate her learning, but it's, it's shared responsibility. Isn't, and, and that's what we are uh, talking about here. I you think the other, add, yeah, I was just going to say the other aspect of this that we talked about um, when we met last week was also that um, for, for sports coaches, there's already a sort of acceptance and understanding that when you're coaching a sports person, you're not only looking at their skills of performance and performativity, but you're also looking about how to help them get in that right mental space and to understand that when you're understanding your, your, yourself as a coach, you know that your responsibility is not just about the, the performance. It's not just about the skills to do your tennis or your golf or your football. Um, it's about also the whole mental approach to that performance. And that I, Herbert and I felt was a wonderful metaphor for understanding. And in fact, there is actually a movement with some, some people in Hungary are doing some great work in coaching now in language teaching where you look at the notion of as a coach, as a seeing yourself as a coach and not just a teacher, you're not just focusing on the linguistic skills. You're focusing on how you help the learner to get the most out of the learning opportunities available to them. Lovely. Um, Sarah, I'll just skip to the next slide, which yep. I think is also yours. Yes, sorry. So we put a note in about this. Um, some of you may know that I feel quite strongly about language teacher psychology and we put a note in and there's a, there's a section in the book where we comment on this. Um, we designed the book to focus on learners and what teachers can do to help learners to get in the right frame of mind. But obviously, as a teacher, your frame of mind is also going to have a huge impact on the learner's frame of mind. And it's not just the explicit things we do, but we have this implicit, this hidden curriculum that we communicate through our body language, how we engage with learners, how we talk to each other, how we talk to colleagues. And that also communicates something about the mental space, that atmosphere that we want to look at. So we were also very keen to make sure that in the book we make reference when it's relevant to how teachers can also think about some of these activities and how they might be relevant for their own well-being, their own resilience, their own growth mindsets and so on. And that we strongly support the notion of teachers also making sure that they engage in self-care and well-being practices to help them be, um, as the next slide suggests, uh, the best kind of role model they can be through what they do in terms of um, their own behaviours, their explicit actions and also their implicit actions. I think Herbert and I have got a bit of a dance going on with the slides now. <laughs> I apologise. I touched my mouse twice and, and I inadvertently touched the wheel on the mouse. And Don't worry about it. But I, just so that the audience know, we've got. I, it's probably my fault because I'm useless with these kinds of things. And Herbert taught me before how I can control his screen. And I did warn him he shouldn't let me near it. So I, I apologize for a bit of dancing there. So you can see that we're actually now role modeling how you deal with errors and mistakes. <laughs> Herbert, over to you to share some of the outline of the book. Okay, right. <laughs> so uh, let's have a look at the table of contents. Um, as you can see, we have two, four, 
six, eight, nine uh, chapters, how to help learners work together, how to facilitate a growth mindset, um, uh, helping learners to, to overcome uh, limiting uh, beliefs um, and helping them to develop um, a, a more facilitating mindset, how to build a sense of confidence, how to boost um, positive um, emotions, how to promote uh, motivation, how to help learners self-regulate, uh, a chapter that we regard as, as very, very important because, of course, um, uh, depending on the age and the maturity of the students, we want them to become their own uh, coaches too. It's not just about the, the teacher um, um, uh, coaching them. We want to help them self-regulate. How to build um, resilience, very important topic. How to foster um, compassion for learning. And last but not least, um, how to promote learner well-being. Jane, Jane Arnold, thanks very much for your, for your comment there that these are very useful topics to discuss and work with. And hello, Jane, uh, great to see you here also. Uh, let's um, quickly now have a look at um, three different activities. Um, the first one um, has a bit of an enigmatic title, uh, and I can tap dance. Um, you, you will see in a minute what this is all about. The second one, discovering strategies to prepare for tests. And the third one, the power of thank you. And we're going to kind of um, give you a taste of these activities. We are inviting you to, uh, again, sh share some of your, your thoughts um, in, the, in the chat box and um, hopefully it can show you, um, you know, in a, in a para, um, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in, 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 can give you a taste of what the activities are about. I almost didn't manage to express myself here. So I can tap dance. Each activity actually starts with a rationale where we give you um, an idea very often with um, an important quote, uh, often also with one or two suggestions for, for further um, reading. Um, this is obviously about um, the teacher's uh, beliefs um, and how important the teacher's um, beliefs in the learner's potential for, for growth and development are um, in establishing a, a, a classroom culture that the learners want to be part of. Um, we, are, we are quoting Carol Dweck here, um, talking about this, this um, um, growth uh, mindset. Uh, and she says, I think it's a lovely quotation, do people with this mindset believe that anyone can be anything, that anyone with proper motivation or education can become Einstein or Beethoven? No, but they believe that a person's true potential is unknown and unknowable, that it is impossible to foresee what can be accomplished with years of passion, toil, and training. Think of what um, the, the young uh, tennis star's coach was actually saying about her, the sky is the limit. We are reflecting on aspects of psychology that play a role in, in the kind of um, uh, process that uh, you can engage your students in when you use this activity. We give you the level of uh, the language cast. In this case, it's B1 upwards. Um, we give you um, uh, examples um, of the language um, and areas of language that are going to be covered and a rough uh, time also. And then uh, what you can't see here is um, a short section on preparation, what kind of um, uh, maybe handouts you need to photocopy. Um, uh, we will show you how that works and where you can get them from. They're all in the book, but they're also on what is called the Helbling E-Zone. So their their um, uh, platform. Uh, and, and of course, you will also find a, a lesson plan with um, detailed uh, suggestions. Here we are not um, giving you the lesson plan, 
we're just giving you some ideas, a taste of some of the content. Um, uh, this is uh, a Garfield cartoon. Some of you may be familiar with it. I don't know how well you can see this. Some of you may be um, watching this, this on a mobile phone. Uh, so let me quickly, in, you know, at least for those colleagues, quickly go through the cartoon with you. We see Garfield uh, standing here uh, saying to himself, I wonder if I could stand on just two feet. And then he gets up on his two feet and says, hey, this is great. I'm standing. And now I can tap dance and I can reach the tabletop. In the next image, Garfield is just being Garfield, but it goes on here with something important. In comes uh, his master, we could say his teacher. In comes John and says, Garfield, cats can't walk on their hind feet. We see the immediate um, outcome of this um, uh, psychological intervention. And um, uh, John actually says, see, and then he says, and, and then Garfield doesn't say anything, but his reaction is um, uh, an, in a kind of inner monologue, thanks a lot, okay? So what we would like you to um, do now, if I can go to the next slide, is um, just answer these two questions for us, please. In the last picture, why does John say C? And what does Garfield really mean when he says, thanks a lot? Can we just have your answers? Oops. Oh, by the way, I haven't shown you this. When you go on the E zone and you want to project this cartoon using, for example, a whiteboard or, or a beamer, you can actually also use the, the color, full color version of it. So when you look at this cartoon again now, you look at the last picture here. Um, what, why does um, uh, John say C? And what does Garfield really mean when he says thanks a lot? Could we just have your answers to this, please? Students and teachers have different expectations. Thanks a lot. I love you too. I'm happy I was able to influence you. I am satisfied, says uh, the teacher. Uh, thanks a lot. You destroyed my dreams and possibilities. Garfield is being sarcastic, okay, um, uh, yes, so we have the, the difference between um, functional um, language uh, meaning and the more pragmatic meaning in this case, okay, um, lovely, thank, thank you, thank you so much, okay, so let's, let's um, uh, quickly go on, and can we ask you to um, give us your own reaction to the Garfield cartoon. Can you again just just type it in the in the chat box? I like Isabel's comment where she says, "Fortunately, some learners learn in spite of their teachers," which is a little bit depressing, but still. <laughs> Uh, it was a missed learning opportunity, yes. Self-belief is irresistible. Possibilities are unknown. Garfield needs more confidence, definitely, and he needs a teacher who understands that. Teaching someone a lesson, um, and it's all about negative affirmation and failure. Uh, Marjorie, absolutely. Many learners get this at home. There is also the opposite, of course. Some parents are fantastic in giving their, their kids support, and that's often what makes the difference, isn't it? It's a trial cartoon to counsel together. Teachers' beliefs are so powerful. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on, please. Um, this is what you would actually see in the book. So the preparation tells you that you're supposed to make a copy of the Garfield cartoon, and then um, there's the procedure, and uh, we are suggesting a number of uh, questions for the students uh, to, to um, reflect on the Garfield cartoons, because, of course, uh, many students won't have the kind of background knowledge that you have and, and won't be able to immediately understand the message uh, behind the, the cartoon. We have um, um, one little task for you. And this involves, first of all, 
um, uh, Nicole is already, I think, thinking about this. She's saying, I'm reminded of some of my own teachers, a way I never want to become myself. Take a bit of time to think of someone who had the opposite influence um, um, on you. Nicole, maybe you had a, a teacher who had some positive influence on you. And so who had positive beliefs about you when you were a child. And then with that in mind, think of a very concrete incident or experience with that person, with that teacher. And it can, of course, also be your mom, Eva Maria. It doesn't have to be a, a teacher. You're absolutely right. And this is our question now, and this is our little task. If you were to write up the story of that incident or experience, what title would you give it? So give us the title of the story of that concrete instance or experience where a teacher or somebody else really believed in you, had positive beliefs about you when you were a child. Lovely, Jonathan, thanks you, thank you. See, I told you you could do this, <laughs> catastrophe. Yes, mom, you were right, trust. Yeah. Give you a bit more time. Learning to ride my bike, lovely. Teacher positive, curious teacher, tell me more. Finding my own two feet, Lucy, lovely. Obviously my parents, okay. My teacher, my hero, wow, wonderful, thank you. Okay, lovely, thank you so much. Very quickly. The, the next activity here, we are just giving you a taste uh, to, to show you that what we are aiming to do here is pretty comprehensive. It's not, you know, um, uh, as, as some colleague, one colleague once said to me, well, psychology, that's all, you know, um, kind of like flower power teaching. No, it's not. Uh, this is science-based and evidence-based and it takes into consideration also uh, that we need to teach and help students discover strategies about learning, discover how to prepare for tests. And this is one example from the book. Um, this is again for B1 upwards, could be adapted to other uh, levels, of course. Um, um, students would actually get a handout first. It's in the book also. It's also online for you to download. Uh, you hand out this, this um, uh, text. Students read uh, what these students say about how they prepare for tests. And each of them has a different strategy. Um, I don't know how well you can, you can read that and I'm not expecting you to read them all anyway. Um, just just to, to give you a taste of what we have here. Then they get this um, list of different stu study strategies. And if you're not, not um, absolutely familiar with all of them, cramming would be um, the student who knows they have a test coming up maybe the next day or the day after and um, they're sitting down for, for three or four, even more hours and cram um, all the knowledge they possibly can into their, into their uh, brain, uh, mind, uh, brain mind system, uh, ho hoping that this will be good for them to pass the test. Highlighting, going through, I don't know, a list of, of uh, chunks of language, a list of, of, of verb forms, a text, uh, and highlighting everything um, one needs to remember about them. Practice testing, I think, speaks for itself. Studying over a longer period of time would be what is also called distributed learning. It's the opposite of cramming, isn't it? Taking a longer period of time and spreading out what one needs to learn over a longer period of time. Rereading, reading through that famous list of chunks of language again and again and again and again. And last but not least, underlining, similar to what highlighting is all about, 
um, uh, but in this case, underlining instead of highlighting. Now, here is our question. Um, uh, Dan Lofsky and um, his co-authors in this study that uh, we're quoting here um, have actually um, uh, carried out a meta study. I think they've looked into um, the outcomes of like like seven or eight hundred different um, studies into what um, student strategies are very uh, powerful, and they've come up with with a list of ten. We have reduced them to six here. And the question to you now is, which of these six study strategies are the most efficient ones? To make this a little easier for you, two of them are by far the most efficient um, um, ones. Can you just type in the, the two numbers, please? Which do you think? Four? Three and four. Come on, we want to see a few more. Four, two and three, four and five, two and three, two and four, two and five, four, four and five, four, two and four, four and five, four. Okay, I must say much better than, than um, I was. When I first uh, read that, I would have got it totally wrong. Uh, most of you are absolutely right. It's practice testing and, and distributed learning, studying over a longer period of time. By the way, um, this uh, fantastic meta study is available online. Um, uh, you might want to download it and read it. It's, it's pretty uh, comprehensive. I think it's, it's more than 50 pages, but it's, it's worth every um, line, actually. Um, and then learners get a copy of this photocopiable worksheet where an expert um, uh, talks to them about getting good results in tests. In tests is not that difficult, okay? And this is it. Over to you, Sarah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Herbert. So for the last one, we decided to engage with you. Um, one of the things that comes up repeatedly, and some people mentioned it earlier in the kinds of strategies you can use to strengthen um, learner well-being, is the positivity that you can gain from gratitude. And I can't make the text appear. <laughs> Thank you, Herbert. My mice don't work anymore. Um, of all the kinds of positive psychology interventions, and this is something that Herbert stressed earlier, is we have tried to make sure that there's always good empirical evidence. Neil Curry just made an interesting comment. He said, well, it's obviously very individual. All this is individual. And what we have tried to do is give you ideas, but not prescribe how you must do it. We know that you're going to adapt this in ways that reflect your group. So Marjorie was talking about using some of these activities in a business English context. Of course, you're going to adapt it. But we've tried to give ideas that we know work for many people, if not everybody, but many people um, that a majority have uh, that research has shown that a majority of people benefit from. And the importance of gratitude for well-being is probably one of the positive psychology interventions with the strongest empirical support. And so we've got a couple of these kinds of activities scattered through the book in the hope that we can give you some ideas of how you can do that. Heather, I can't control it anymore. I don't know why. Thank you. Um, sharing your gratitude with others, thanking people, reciprocity. This activity is designed not only to think about what you're grateful for, but to give you the opportunity to tell somebody that, to tell the person that. And it's this idea that when you articulate that, not only do you benefit from reflecting on what you're grateful for and what you're positive about, but when you thank a person, they benefit enormously as well. They also get to feel very positive about themselves. How about the next slide, please? This is just the outline that shows you we've got this rationale, we've got the aspect of psychology, the level, the language and the time, and that's for every activity so that you can see, you can pick and choose when you're working with the book and say, I want something at the moment that addresses the issue of gratitude, and you can look through the book and say, these activities work on gratitude, which one suits what we're doing at the moment, which one can I pick out and use? Next slide. So, in the chat box, this is another challenge to see how quick Herbert and I can read. Who was the last person you thanked and what did you thank them for? Who was the last person you thanked and what did you thank them for? 
anybody it can be any context who was the last person you thanked? wife made dinner lucky you girlfriend made lunch lucky you <laughs> and, and the daughter made a dessert also, there's a lot of food here but at least people are being very appreciative Lovely. Oh, that's a nice comment, Nicole. That's interesting. Mum made soup, cousin for a lovely weekend, my father, God for my family, my health, a colleague for taking you to a course, my husband for carrying my bags, <laughs> lovely. A colleague for offering to pick me up from the book fair, a friend, my sister, my husband, my professor for giving positive comments, friend for sharing support. I'm just going back up to what Nicole said, where she said it's interesting that we're focusing on thank you. She said she has a very noisy class, and the moment she started to thank those students who worked silently by saying thank you, so and so, the whole class became quiet and all smiled after she thanked them. I think this is a wonderful comment. It's a great idea and a lovely comment. So when you when you thank when you show somebody when you express your thanks it makes that person visible and it makes visible what they have done and how you appreciate that and you benefit from appreciating that and also for communicating that. Um, who was the last person who thanked you and what was it for? How did it feel to be thanked genuinely? So how did you feel the last time somebody thanked you for something? How did you feel the last time that thanked somebody thanked you for something? how it makes you feel. Wonderful, great. It usually puts a smile on your face. Happy, Jessica, happy and important. That's nice, Stephanie, you feel valued and worthy, Amir. That's a great way of putting it, worthy. Somebody is appreciating and valuing you. Proud, Nicole, yes, very much so. Emotional, oh yes, Elizabeth. Seen, that's a lovely way of putting it. Seen, I think that's so important. You feel seen, somebody's noted that. Um, and it's student, Jane, Oh, that's so lovely. Sister, for giving you thanks. It's like a, oh, Heike has put that beautifully. It's like a small gift. It is, it very much is. And I think it's so important to think about this. If we want to encourage our learners to take part in pro-social behaviors, thanking them for positive behaviors, thanking them for when they have done things that contribute to the group, that can all encourage this notion of altruism and pro-social behaviors. Thank you, Herbert, for the remaining text so think about as you leave now think about who offers you support in your professional life and whether you have thanked them explicitly and who else you might want to say thank you to in the coming days so anybody that you haven't said thank you to recently and that also is things like when you get off the bus that you thank the driver or that when you're in a supermarket and somebody checks out that you thank them for checking you out with a smile that you make people as, as Heike said earlier you make people feel seen you make them feel visible well we want to thank you Herbert and I and Marion we want to thank you for coming along today and for showing interest in the books. And we have time for questions, I believe, just about. We'll just comment on two that I noted earlier. So Elizabeth asked, is the book for different levels? And Marjorie asked, could it be used in a business English context? Um, well, I think it can definitely be used with, with adult students uh, too. Obviously, some of the activities will be more for like teenage um, students, but um, I, I think uh, I'm not I'm not a teacher of business English, but but I think um, you have plenty of activities there that you could use in in that context. You may have, as as with any activity, you may have to to adapt uh, uh, to your needs there. Are there any team building activities for younger learners in lower levels? Um, yes, um, the first uh, chapter is actually about learning together and that um, uh, has uh, various activities also for, for younger learners but not um, primary uh, learners, so younger as in teenagers. How can a teacher keep up with their own well-being? I think this is one for you yeah. when they're hardly noticed and appreciated for all they do by their school. I found this too demotivating. I too, Samia, you're quite right. And I think when institutions don't value or even societies don't value and appreciate their teachers, I think it's a huge problem. Um, and hopefully, you know, some of the activities in this book will help a little bit. Um, something just thinking about the notion of gratitude and thanks. Um, there's something called a positivity portfolio. 
and a positivity portfolio is where as a teacher you keep so I don't know if you can see on my desk but that little pile of stuff there is every time a learner or a student or a teacher gives me an email or gives me a card and says thanks for this or I really enjoyed that I keep it because I mean you're right we don't always get appreciated by the institutions where we work and it's really nice sometimes if you're having a little bit of a motivation dip just remind yourself go to your positivity portfolio and have a look at previous thanks from students and colleagues and just remind yourself of all the good things it's not to say that we excuse institutions for their lack of appreciation and lack of structural support for teacher well-being but there are things we can do ourselves to make the most of a bad situation is there any other questions I, I like the question, when is the printed version available? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the, the digital version is available now and the printed one will be available as from uh, November. Thank you, Nia. And thank you all for your lovely positive comments and for also for interacting with us so greatly in the chat box. It may be Absolutely. a bit hectic at the beginning, but we caught up. <laughs> <laughs> Any tips on how to motivate extremely passive um, learners? Well, um, I think a, a number of activities really. Um, the question with extremely passive uh, learners is always where does their passi passivity um, actually come from? And, and very often being passive has to do with, with um, uh, previous experiences with uh, not being uh, valued, um, uh, with um, maybe even the way they were brought up in their, in their own um, uh, family um, settings, etc., etc. So uh, many of the activities in the, in the book will actually help you to tackle the problem. Look, we are not, we are not saying, you know, use activity 3.2 and then your passive learners will be, will be the most active learners. It's, it's a process that takes time, but it's also a process where you will notice signs and, and signs of improvement. And of course, then it's you with your, your um, um, coaching um, uh, passion and you as a leader who will actually um, um, reward and and uh, show your your students that you are noticing the the signs, even if they are very subtle signs, and that I think is very important. So I think it's it's time to say thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.